welcome back ladies and gentlemen to Skyrim. My name's Camel and more importantly, welcome back to the Curating Curious Curiosity series for a long awaited new episode. In this video today, I will be curating to you the curious curiosities that can be found within Blackreach. Before we get cracking, timestamps for each of the curiosities in this video can be found down in the description and in the comments. Now down there in the description you can also find links to my other Curating Curious Curiosities videos and to my social media. Be sure to check all of that out. So Blackreach, or as it was once known in the Dormeris tongue, Fal Zadam Din, which translates to the Blackest Kingdom Reaches. It's a massive Dwemer city located within a colossal natural cavern far beneath the surface of Skyrim. The air is thick with ephemeral spores and floating specks of unknown origin dancing through the dense cavern air. Many giant glowing mushrooms grow throughout the cavern providing natural lighting painting Blackreach with an ethereal blue brush. There is a teal fog that haunts Falza Dum Din, thick with colour and arcane particles making it hard for one to grasp the true size of Blackreach blanketing the cavern in even more mystery. This mist, mixed with the occasional electric glow of a strange Dwemer structure, sets an almost neon stage, creating a futuristic yet simultaneously ancient setting, with lively magical properties yet also deathly desolate and forgotten elements of a strange and archaic society, the Dwemer. But why does Blackreach exist? It was originally colonized by the Dwemer once they discovered a considerable source of Ethereum down here. It's a natural mineral which bears notable magical properties. The Dwemer built four cities to harness the full potential of this Ethereum. Arkanthums, which served as a command center and the primary research center. Betharzel was a city that's purpose at this time is currently unknown. Mazulft was used as a storage site and Raldbathar, which would deal with the mining operations. Strangely, the Ethereum Forge located at the city of Bethalft was not part of the Alliance or attached to Blackreach but it was used to process the Ethereum into exorbitantly powerful artifacts. At first, the Ethereum Alliance was successful, the four cities bringing peace, harmony, and scientific and technological advancement to the Dwemer. However, after three years, just three years, the four cities began to want independent control over the Ethereum, the Ethereum Forge, and the incredible items of power it could create. This conflict was known as the Ethereum Wars. What is left? Well, what is left is Blackreach. An almost unbelievable sight for any traveller, explorer or scholar that intentionally or accidentally finds their way here. A location that can be very intense and overwhelming at times, but that is why I love it, because for once it's a dungeon that beats you, rather than you beating it. Though for this reason a lot of players have not fully explored Blackreach and discovered all of its strange and wonderful secrets, and that is why we are gathered here today to safely and fully explore this great ancient city, Blackreach. So without further hesitation, let the curation begin. Now the second we exit the Alphatan's Cathedral and enter Blackreach, we'll be met by something quite interesting, a Dwemer Ballista mounted on the wall. It's loaded and ready to go. We'll see that it can be activated with this here lever. Upon doing so, it will release all three Dwarven Ballista bolts, launching them directly at the door of this house just across the way. Why on Nern there would be a Dwemer Ballista aimed right at the door of a house? Now that is genuinely curious. Maybe this was set here during the Ethereum Wars and designed as a surprise attack. Knock knock, who's there? Three. Three who? Three Dwemer Ballista bolts through your chest as you open the door in the morning to get your mail. Haha, <laughs> classic Dwemer joke. All jests aside, a heavy artillery device pointed at the door of a house is very strange indeed, almost as if whatever was inside was a great threat. So moving over to the house in which the ballista was aimed at, we'll see there is a dwarven sphere waiting right in front of the door. Again, why such security? It seems at the very least that this sphere has been posted here, or has been alarmed to a threat nearby, which we would assume is within the house. And that's backed up by the ballista being pointed directly at the door. Now this house is known as Sindorion's Field Laboratory, 
a name that might sound familiar to you. Inside there is a wide array of varying items that will capture our interest. Over on one side there is a laboratory part of the interior, with clusters and bunches of a multitude of strange and rare alchemical ingredients. There are books too for arcane study and an enchanting table and an alchemy bench. Their purposes are obvious of course, but by far the alchemical ingredients outweigh any other items, therefore suggesting that whoever lived here was an alchemist, and quite an advanced alchemist by the looks of things. Now over on the other side of this house we'll find a bedroom, but more interestingly a skeleton, lying on the ground with three dwarven arrows sticking out of its back. This is the skeleton of Sindurion. On him we can find his journal which recounts his journey to Blackreach in pursuit of the Crimson Nernroot, a plant that only grows within Blackreach. We'll also notice that the journal entry was made only 142 years before the events of Skyrim. So Sindorian was definitely not a Dwemer, as they vanished roughly 4,000 years before the events of Skyrim. But we do actually know who Sindurion is or was, as in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion he was the ultimate alchemist that gave us the quest to collect Nernroot. And if you thought that that quest was annoying, well Sindorian's come back to haunt you, as after reading his journal we'll get a quest to collect 30 Crimson Nernroot and return them to the Sarathi sisters in Riften, who we've taken a look at before in the 10 things you didn't need to know about Skyrim. Okay, but now let's get back to the present. He has three dwarven arrows in him, so he was killed by dwarven arrows. Outside the house, there is a dwarven sphere who has a crossbow on one of his arms. This, however, shoots dwarven bolts and not dwarven arrows. So while I feel that the Dwarven Sphere was placed outside this house and meant to suggest that it was the one that shot Dwarven Arrows into Sindorian, it doesn't actually line up as again, these Dwarven Spheres don't shoot arrows, they shoot bolts. And if the Dwarven Sphere is here to kill him and succeeded, then this happened no more than 142 years ago. So who set up the ballista bolt aimed directly at the door of the laboratory and why? It's a pretty strange collection of findings here, and a death that doesn't really quite line up. But one thing's for sure, he gave someone the Crimson Nernroot quest and they rage quit and killed him. Hell, he might have even shot himself in the back just to put himself out of the misery of the Crimson Nernroot. And while that is physically impossible, eh, some people go to great lengths when trying to escape the ring of a Nernroot. Now this is an uncommon but present site within Blackreach, a Dwemer dwelling that has fallen over the millennia, rendered unenterable by rubble and destruction of the surrounding foundations. It's sad that we don't get to explore more of these Dwarven homes to see how the Dwemer lived, but there is one more home we can explore much later on in the video. Now just to the east of Sindorian's field laboratory we have the Falmer pump station. There is a small ditch with stairs leading down into it. This appears to have once been some sort of pumping station node or something of the sort. But now there is a Falmer that stands guard here and also a few Chorus Reaper pods. It's likely this Falmer is making sure these Reapers grow to a full healthy size. He's probably some kind of incubation overseer. Now just up above this plumbing pit, glued to the cavern wall is the giant glowing mushroom. And while big glowing mushrooms are very common in Blackreach, this is the actual alchemical ingredient named glowing mushroom. Now this one is also a whopping 20 times larger than the standard glowing mushroom size, as we can see here with the player character next to it. This is one hell of a fungal infection, so be sure to protect your toenails while coming to visit. Next, just to the northwest of Sindorian's field laboratory, we have the Deep Mist Crossing. Here we'll observe several waterfalls slowly falling from the stone cavern ceiling and walls. The source of all of this water is unknown, but it does supply all of the waterways we find within Blackreach. A gorgeous sight when the mist sprays and the soft neon glow of the mushrooms mix into a dancing cloud of ethereal vapors. Vapenatial! Anyway, <laughs> there appears to be a lot of rocks and such in the body of water. There are also these stone posts with metal rings, suggesting that there was once a bridge or crossing here. Along with the rocks, we'll also find various pieces of rubble with Dwemer markings on them 
pointing to the notion that there was once a bridge or something of the sort here. That bridge's time has long passed and now all that remains are the blue washed bones of its structure. I could be right or I could just be bridging gaps in information. Oh and just to uh, top this one off, weirdly underneath the ground there's another one of these stone posts. Why it's 10 feet underground, I don't know. If you do know, be sure to make a post about it. Next up we have the Reeking Tower tucked away in the northern corner of Blackreach. As we approach, a huge carve out in the rock face will be presented layered in thick gossamer webbing, a deep moat of silk surrounding the towering island in the middle. This island houses the Reeking Tower. Now just outside the tower entrance there is a glowing blue rock and while it's not confirmed at all, by studying all accounts, an educated deduction of the information would land on the conclusion that this is, or at least these glowing rocks found within Blackreach are, actually, raw ethereum deposits. But that's enough speculation for now, let us enter the Reeking Tower. As we ascend up the twisting tower passages, we'll find many signs of spiders, and soon enough, some actual spiders. No surprises really. Towards the top of the tower, there is a ramped room with spiders, spider eggs, and a chest tucked away behind a curtain of webbing. There is also an elevator that will take us to the top. As soon as we reach the surface once more, we'll be met by a desiccated corpse, wrapped up and digesting in poisonous enzymatic fang fluids. Just over the lip of the stairs is a giant spider waiting for its next victim, which will not be me. Moving around the corner behind the wall, there is another spider waiting for more food. Again, I'm not on the menu. And... Just for all the spider lovers out there, there is another third giant spider waiting in the web towards the ceiling and will drop down, giving you a fright while you eat your curds and whey, like Little Miss Muffet. Now something odd I found here are these cocooned up victims. The cocoons are massive, several times larger than the player character. So I genuinely cannot think as to what is in these cocoons. And while there are several unexpected creatures to be found in Blackreach, which we'll run into later on, which of them would make sense to fill up a large cocoon? I don't know. I really don't know. Anyway, this place absolutely stinks. So let's move away from the reeking tower. Nestled away in a small lull in the land, there is a tiny Falmer village. There are two huts, but only one Falmer standing out in the middle of the small village. Perhaps his friends are out doing chores, finding some more mushrooms to grill. There is also a Chorus Reaper pod here, so be careful of that. But most importantly, there is a little wooden rack with fish on it, revealing to us that this is a little Falmer fisherman. And he must be quite a catch to all the Falmer ladies out there. But for now though, we'll reel ourselves in and move on to the next curiosity. As we make our way through the rocks and mushrooms of Blackreach, as we approach the open at the water's edge, we'll be met by ephemerally flickering baubles of an ethereal light, dancing and gliding through the dense cavern air. Wisps. Three of them. And to anyone who has played a lot of Skyrim, we all know what three wisps means. But there is a wisp mother somewhere around here. And sure enough, up she'll pop. And bloody hell, apparently I have a particular mod installed, taking Wisp Mother to another level. Okay, so now that the two biggest distractions are out of the picture, what is a Wisp Mother doing down here, all the way underground in Blackreach? Well, given we don't really know the origins of Wisps or Wisp Mothers, it's quite hard to say how they got down here, when we don't know where they come from anyway. Some theories suggest that Wisp Mothers are the ghosts of Snow Elves and that the Wisps are lost souls. Other theories suggest that Wisp Mothers are necromancers that sought after immortality through undeath. No theory is proven or disproven, so take your pick. But we do know that they can't yell. All they can do is wisp er. Now just up the hill we have a rather strange and unique find. There are several stone stairs leading up from the dirt area where we met the wisps to some higher ground. Then following the pathway at the top, we'll be led through a beautifully lit passageway in the rocks. 
peppered and showered with stunning glowered mushrooms. We'll soon come out onto a small walkway that leads to a circular platform in the middle of the water. From here, there are two large pipes leading to a stone block on the edge of the water. There are a number of hatches and covers on this, their purpose unknown, but they all have a slightly different design. And the actual purpose of this entire setup is also unknown, but it is a very elaborate and strange sight. So many pipes leaning here and there with vents, tubes, hatches and valves sprouting out of the stone like the mushrooms that surround this very spot. Centered right underneath the circular platform that sits up above the water, there is actually a water intake. At first I was unsure as to what this was, but later on in the video we'll see this exact same model half submerged with splashing water, suggesting that it is in fact a water intake. So the water is being taken and processed in some way through this tonal valve station. Where the water is going and what the water is then doing, that is currently unknown. I guess you could say it's just another drop in the sea of curiosities down here in Blackreach. Next we have the bad real estate, found just behind Sindorian's field laboratory that we saw earlier lurking in the shadows there is an abandoned Falma hut. I'm assuming it was abandoned because there is no Falma here nor are there any signs of a Falma living here recently. And just next door we have another piece of terrible real estate, another Dwemer dwelling that has been caved in and collapsed over the years. And next to this is where the Thelma has actually chosen to live, in a little Dwemer pavilion. While it's not the ideal place to live, in these hard times, you have to choose the best place you can afford. And just off the road from this Thelma, we have the Guardian of the Northeast. Here we will find a Dwemer Centurion station, where, as one might expect, there is a Dwarven Centurion sleeping waiting to be deployed. It would appear the Dwemer placed this here as a roadside security measure. There is also a chest right next to this hulking construct, which will of course contain random lovered loot. On the other side we have a switch, which when activated will boot up the Centurion so it's ready for combat. It's strange to have a switch initiated Dwarven Centurion. I feel like it's kind of archaic, which is ironic as this particular contraption is just that archaic. But for the Dwemer, I feel like they could have a more elaborate, technologically advanced system of deploying security measures rather than having to physically pull a lever. But once it is activated, naturally, it will be a little steamed off. Now, just across the road from the poor area, we have the prime real estate. Unlike those shabby shanties across the way, this is some top shelf housing right here. An old Dwemer tower of some kind is now the viewing ground for these Thalma. There are also two chairs where we can sit and observe the vast cavernous abyss before us in all its glory. There is also a chest here which will contain random leveled loot, soon to contain all of the rubies that I'll need for rolling through my fingers while I throw my head back and cackle from this position of dominance and wealth. <laughs> Now down on the ground level of this very same structure and around the back we have the shadow shrouded stash. It is tucked away and in a rather obscure area if you really think about it. I mean sure a chest is used to keep loot safe, but it's not exactly protected down here. It seems quite open to anyone just wandering around and taking some stuff from it. Makes me think it may have been here as some kind of deposit box in which anyone would and could drop stuff into it or take stuff from it. I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of this obscure yet open chest is. It seems to go against the purpose of a treasure chest. I guess you could say that it's quite a cache. C-A-C-H-E that is. And that joke is definitely funnier when written down. Even then it may cause instant fatality. And just like my humour, we have another fungal intrigue to inspect, as at this very same tower around the other side from the chest, just off to the south of the wonderful balcony we observed just a minute ago, we can find the mushroom Namira's Rot, except that this one is the largest in the game. It's three times the size of a normal Namira's Rot, as we can see here with the player character in shot for a size comparison. What has made this super big? Well, I mean, if there's a place for it, surely it's Blackreach. 
While it's not a mind-blowing size like with the giant glowing mushroom we saw earlier, it is still quite impressive. And three times the mushroom equals three times the fun. Haha, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. Yes, that's right, three times the mushroom risotto. Or for the Thelma, three times the blindness. Now this next curiosity really got my attention. So again, at the very back of this very same tower, there is a large stone arch resting next to the building. It took me a minute, but straight away there was something very strange about this particular stone pillar. Have you spotted it yet? The pattern on it. It's not Dwemer. The pattern on it is of a Nordic origin. So we have a giant piece of stone here, either from an ancient Nordic ruin or was carved by the Nords of old, or perhaps even the Atmorans. I can also confirm that this is the only piece of rock down here in Blackreach that boasts Nordic patterns or seems to be of Nordic origin, which would suggest that there never was a Nordic ruin or Nordic culture down here at any point. And just for comparison, the pattern on Dwemer ruins appears to be much broader and bolder, whereas the Nordic patterns are smaller and more intricate. And of course we see this exact stonework in abundance throughout the many ancient Nordic burial sites found throughout Skyrim. So what is this doing down here? Well, the Atmorans came to Skyrim during the Marethic Era, and Blackreach was colonized by the Dwemer during the First Era. So there is definitely some crossover time periods there. Uh, maybe the Atmorans slash Ancient Nords came down here, made a pillar, then bailed. Although that is an absolutely ridiculous explanation. Maybe they came down here and worked with the Dwemer. But why do we not see more signs of Nordic presence in Blackreach? Why just this one arch. Maybe this piece fell down from a Nordic ruin high above the ceiling of Blackreach that was built into the ground and as they dug deeper and deeper and built deeper and deeper they pierced through the ceiling accidentally and this section of that Nordic ruin fell down into Blackreach. Again it sounds pretty goofy and of course if you look up there's no signs of any Nordic ruin up there. So how did this Nordic stone arch get into Blackreach? I truly do not know. No theory really adds up more than any of the other theories. Nah, I guess when it comes to Blackreach, it's just another story arch. Now just behind this tower that we've been at for the past five minutes, there is a small cove tucked away in a corner and veiled by a depression in the stone ceiling. These are the stairs of asininity. They lead up from this small pond and into dead ends. There's nothing up here. Stairs that lead to nothing. They really do live up to their name. There is also a Crimson Nurn Root and a Chorus Reaper Pod here, which doesn't help explain why these stairs lead up to small little cupboard sized rooms that have no seemingly apparent purpose. Your help in solving this would be much appreciated. Moving back towards the center, we have the Fungal Field Courtyard. It's an area that seems to serve no purpose but has a great wall built around one side and the largest paved area in all of Blackreach, apart from the Silent City which we'll get to much later on. So it seems pointless, but it is a wondrous effervescent luminescence showering down from the fields of brilliant mushrooms. It doesn't seem to serve any purpose other than just being wholesomely eye-pleasing. Maybe the Dwemer were growing these mushroom forests for a reason. Maybe it's just their version of having a park in a city. It would be a lovely place to sit down, but there are no seats. I guess you'd have to pull up a stool. A toadstool. Now just next to this mushroom field, we have the Twin Tower Gate. This appears to be some kind of watchtower, maybe? It's like a barracks of some kind, where guards could keep an eye out and keep the peace from a good height. Although it may have had some other purpose that isn't clear upon first inspection. As if we head around the back, there is a path that leads up to the other side, and all along it, there are these pipes protruding out of the ground. They would appear to be vents of some kind, although the tops of them are sealed. Quite curious as to what the purpose could be. Or more, what's below here that requires vent pipes coming out of the ground. But there is something much more interesting here. Something that, quite appropriately, dwarfs all other curiosities around in the Dwarven City. A monolithic fungi that took the phrase, sky's the limit, a little too literally. This is what I call the Mother Mushroom, an absolute behemoth, 
the biggest mushroom in the entire game of Skyrim, and even the biggest I've ever seen in all of the Elder Scrolls games. It's so monstrous, it makes those Telvanni mushroom towers look like mere pizza toppings in comparison. I would guess that this is the mushroom that started it all. The OG shroom that gave birth to all the other mushrooms in this cavern. We'll even see it's got these reaching tentacles fondling for foundation to grip into the earth and spread its glowing infection. It is bedazzling to behold, flirtatiously blinding to stare at. The ephemeral flickers of bioluminescence leave us with our jaws on the floor. It truly is something special. It appears to have a completely rigid stem as well. If we look at the other giant mushroom next to it, we'll see that the smaller one sways back and forth, suggesting that its stem is more flexible, whereas the mother mushroom stays in place and projects its stability and position within Blackreach, implying that it is far more ancient than any other fungi down here. Truly a sight to see, and one that we can see from just about anywhere within the cavern of Falzadam Din. In fact, it's so stunning that it really doesn't leave much room for further discussion. Ah uh, yes, now moving back over next to the Wisp Mother, we have the Wooden Bridge, a curiosity that has actually got me confused. So what do we have? We have a poorly built bridge made of wooden planks. Okay, cool. Who built this? Well, definitely not the Dwemer. They don't use wood, and we'll also find other bridges in Blackreach that are great stone structures. So if not the Dwemer who built this, well, we know that there are a number of travelers and others who have found Blackreach over the millennia, so it could be any of them. There are also populations of Thalma down here, so it could have been them as well. But what has me particularly confused is what it's made from. Wood. As mentioned, the Dwemer didn't use wood in their building, so the wood wasn't scavenged from an already existing structure in Blackreach, and there are of course no trees in Blackreach. So the only explanation is that someone carried planks of wood all the way down into Blackreach just to build a crummy bridge. The effort to reward ratio is too off for me. We best leave it as someone important may have built it and we really don't want to burn any bridges. Now moving down the stream back towards the Mother Mushroom, we have something that is rather hard to see. As we wander down this cobbled pathway, we'll spot many clusters of Chorus eggs, but no Chorus. Surely they would be here protecting their eggs. Well, they are. We just can't see them. As tucked away in the shrubs, here are the Chorus curled up and sleeping. Aw, oh, isn't it cute? Though, well, in the next bush is a baby Chorus, all curled up and sleeping. Isn't he adorable? Nah, still not adorable. So if we approach the eggs and the bushes, the two sleeping chorus will awaken to protect their eggs. And I gotta say, when they're awake, still not cute. Ugh, even the baby ones are disgusting Enwa. Okay, so just above the sleeping chorus is our next curiosity, the Watcher's Wall. The pathway up onto the wall leads straight from the back of the Twin Tower Gate we saw earlier. This would appear to be some kind of vantage point from which the Dwemer guards could get a good view of the surrounding area making sure everything was in order. It's kind of interesting, but when it comes to Black Creature's curiosities, it definitely won't make the Wall of Fame. Just across the way, keeping this place even safer, is the Central Centurion. Named aptly, as it is a Dwemer Centurion located roughly in the center of Blackreach, mimicking the purpose of the other Centurion we saw earlier. This was placed here as a security measure. After all, the Dwemer were mining Ethereum down here, an almost pricelessly rare and powerful material. So it's no surprise that they put some security protocols in place, although again, it is activated via a lever. I do feel that this is a bit primitive for such an advanced facility. Anyway, it is how it is. Shining on through the curiosities just across the road and in the river, we have the next curiosity. This is a strange one indeed. You may have noticed that in the middle of the water, there is a random light lazily flickering away under the water, but it has no light source. I even went through the ground with no clip and found nothing. There is nothing below, there is nothing beside it, there's nothing above it. Where this light is coming from is truly a mystery. A mystery that needs some light shed on it. 
casually flowing down the river from the light with no source, we have the Petite Pier. This is a rather quaint spot that doesn't really have anything crazy happening, it's just a very unique and lovely touch. Jutting gingerly out into the incandescent water of the deep with a gentle bubble and babble as the current is mitigated to the side slightly. There are two seats here suggesting that this was a place of peace and relaxation where the Dwemer of old would come and sit by the water's edge to ponder the mysteries beyond them. Which let's be honest, there weren't many mysteries beyond the Dwemer. It could have also been used for small boats to dock against but I do believe the first three is more accurate as there are no sign of boats down here, or even the need of boats down here. There is a small basket here which sadly contains nothing. A small sprouting of roots and mushrooms stand on the stone, providing an air of archaism and the shadow of a time long past. Still it remains a comfortably quaint find in this cavern of old. A tad down the path from the petite pier we have the beacon of Blackreach and oh boy! When the Dwemer get back and realise they've left the light on for 4,000 years, they're not going to be happy with the electricity bill. This is actually, at least I feel, a strange thing to find down here. Lighting up a cavern where people are working definitely makes sense. But it's hard to tell how much this light is actually doing. Perhaps if it were shut off, we wouldn't be able to see half the things we've seen so far. But I feel like with all the mushrooms around, Black Reach has got some pretty good natural lighting. But again, there is no way of telling how essential this beacon of Blackreach is when it comes to being able to see. A rather interesting and unique find, nonetheless, and definitely one that will brighten up your day. And just a stone's throw away, we have the arena. And not the Elder Scrolls one. Okay, so this is actually a pretty interesting area. There is an obvious arena style structure with the fighting ground on the circle here, and there are a number of tiered seats for spectators to place themselves and throw cheers and mocks at the contestants. Up the top, there appears to be seats reserved for two special people me and my ego. And just like Anu's soul, my ego has its own ego. Ego EL. That's a really bad deep lore joke about Anu, Anu EL, and Oriel. Let's move on from this. Anyway, on the table here, there is the Heavy Armor Skill Book, 2920 Volume 6 Mid Year. Why this is in a Dwemer ruin doesn't really make any sense, as the Dwemer would not have had books like this, especially books containing the events that transpired during the middle of a year that took place 2,220 years after the Dwemer vanished. So this book was probably placed here by a developer just to give you some good loot while exploring Blackreach, but in terms of lore, yeah, this doesn't really make sense unless someone from the modern day came down here, put a book here, and then left. Again, doesn't really make sense. But that's my theory behind a modern day book being in an ancient ruin. Anyway, back down to the arena, we'll notice that there is a slot that runs through the middle of the entire arena floor. Well, over on the side, there is a lever. When it is activated, a Dwemer spinning blade trap will rise from the channel in the floor and proceed to do what it is designed for. Epic Beyblade battles. I do believe in Roman culture adding additional elements to an arena was known to occur, like adding lines into the fight or spiked pits. This I'm sure is a reflection of that, just some extra spicy component to add to the already pretty serious situation, a fight to the death. Now what's really got me interested is why? The Dwemer was so advanced, surely an arena battle would be so below them in their society. As far as I'm aware, having one-on-one -on -one glory battles like this is not a documented part of the Dwemer culture. Aspects of the Dwemer culture that were revered and honoured and worshipped were things like mathematics and engineering, knowledge, wisdom, logic. One-on-one -on -one combat death sports were not something the Dwemer would be into. And while they definitely did show signs of absolute cold-hearted savagery throughout the ages, it was always a cold calculation, again logical, it wasn't for fun or enjoyment or entertainment. And here's another thing, the Dwemer built in Blackreach to harvest Ethereum. So having an arena in what is essentially a workplace, eh, it doesn't really make sense. But hey, who knows, the Dwemer were mysterious people. But we'll find more about that in the Elder Scrolls 6 Arena 2 Dwemer Edition. Now speaking of battles, it's time to explore another interior area namely the War Quarter, a location found just next to the arena, so maybe the two are linked. Anyway, in we go. 
So in here, there appears to be some vast, rather empty rooms. Following the hallways through, we'll be met by this strange object, the purpose of which is a mystery to me, but one I have not seen the like of before. To the right, we have a weird room with seven beds placed out, all facing the center. Now this is a triple Easter egg. Firstly, the beds are laid out exactly like the altars in Alien vs Predator. There is also seven of them and they can be found in an ancient ruin, just like in Alien vs Predator. Secondly, the seven beds could represent the seven dwarf kings from the Lord of the Rings. After all, we are in Blackreach, a deep dwarven city. And thirdly, the seven beds could represent the seven dwarves from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, as again we are in a dwarven city. Now to add to this last theory, up the hallway there is another room at the end which contains one larger bed. This could either be the one ring to rule them all to go along with the Lord of the Rings theory or this could represent Snow White, the one big human when compared to the Seven Dwarves. But uh, take your pick, just like the Seven Dwarves when they went to work. Now back to the actual game, when I heard War Quarter I expected something warlike, right? We have seven small beds and one big bed, this doesn't really speak war to me. Now out on the small balcony there are two chests, which will of course contain random leveled loot, but you know I expected an armory, weapon racks, armor racks, a battle plans room, experimental weapon stations where we could find some crazy unique Dwemer weapon that they are working on, but no we just found an Airbnb. Again, this is the war quarter, not the snooze quarter, so I'm not too sure what the deal is with a lack of correspondence with a name, War Quarter, and what we actually find inside. Regardless, it's a pretty cool place, although its name, the War Quarter, only makes me wonder, where are the other three quarters? For this next curiosity, we have the Silent Ruin, which is way back next to the Wisp Mother we saw earlier, and the Silent Ruin isn't to be confused with the Silent City which we'll get to at the end of the video, although the Silent Ruin is next to the Silent City. Anyway, it's a very strange kind of standalone structure, which straight away makes it a strange find. Heading on inside, we'll be met by a rather regal looking room. While it is small, the ceiling is high, and there is a higher tiered area with what appears to be a throne. There are a number of small and large pots dotted around the perimeter of the room, serving no immediate purpose. On one side of the room we have a chest which will contain random level loot, and on the other side there is a cabinet with a small collection of dining equipment. Then we have the throne, next to which is a crimson nern root planted within a great golden urn. Sitting on the throne is the block skill book Warrior. Again, this shouldn't be here, all books the Dwemer had were written in Dwemeris and were not written after the Dwemer disappeared, because that would be impossible. Anyway, once we move this lore hole from the throne, we can sit on it. And boy oh boy would you look at that. As we sit down, the player character rests their feet on a pressure plate in front of the throne, which activates the dwarves favorite toy, the spinning dwebber blade trap. Now when you stand up, you'll be battered by the blades having your shins obliterated to splinters, just like when you jump off something slightly too high. Now this is incredibly strange to me, because this room appeared to be a throne room or a council chamber or something of the sort, but once you sit down on the throne, you're doomed to death, or at the very least, you'll be a foot or two shorter than you were when you sat down. Maybe this is how the dwarves got their name. <laughs> They all sat in this chair. So what the hell could the purpose of this room be? I was thinking something like solitary confinement. You sit down and you can't get up. And you also have a crimson nern root next to your head blaring away, sending you insane. Hell, maybe this is some kind of torture chamber, but it looks a little lavish. Surely a torture chamber would be a bit more grim looking. But then again, the Dwemer did some weird stuff, so who knows? A very curious find indeed, and one that has left me puzzled. Now making our way from the silent ruin to the west, we will find a depression in the land which leads down under an overpass. Here we will find the Underguard, a dwarven centurion in its respective station. There is also another station across from it, but this one is empty. 
although the foot slots on this empty one are actually facing the wrong way, so if there were a centurion in here, it would be facing the wall. Now, as with the others we've seen, this centurion was placed here as a security measure and can be activated by pulling the lever next to it. It will look a little dusty, but that's to be expected after sleeping for over 4,000 years, which I did once on a weekend. Slept in a bit too long? Uh, don't try it. And out near the tunnel entrance, there is also a chest, which is a weird place for a chest. Normally, they're opposite the back. Ooh. Might need to retire after that one. Now, if we head up the hill from here to the northwest, we'll be making our way up towards... Oh, Jesus Christ, Dwemer spelling, I swear to God. Mazinkleft Gatehouse. That really flows off the tongue, that one. As we climb the slope while following a twisting road, our hardship will be glazed over with a gorgeous sighting of glowing mushrooms peppered along the pathway perimeter. Soon, the towering gatehouse will be before us. But it's hiding something. If instead of going along the pathway, we go around to the left of the walled tower, we can hop our way up behind the walls, where we can spot something. Hidden away, a chest. Yes, that's right. If you look hard enough in Skyrim, you'll probably end up finding a chest. Now, the chest will, of course, contain random leveled loot. And I love stuff like this that rewards the explorer. It makes us want to search out every last nook and cranny in the game. Whoever did the environmental storytelling is my new chest friend. And heading back down the hill to the overpass above the underguard, we have the Lonely Giant. A really cool find in Blackreach and also a really confusing one. With his club resting over his shoulder, he slowly meanders up and down this road. How a giant got down into Blackreach, I really don't know. Maybe giants have always been down here. Maybe they used to work alongside the Dwemer. Or maybe there is just another way down into Blackreach we haven't seen yet, as I can't really picture a giant using an elevator, or even fitting in the elevator. But it does make it harder to say what he's doing down here, when we don't know how he got down here or how long he's been down here. Maybe he came down last week and he's just lost. Maybe he's been living here his whole life and he's just going for a walk. So to try and guess whether he's protecting something, he's just patrolling the area looking for something, guarding someone or something, I mean who knows. Apart from the giant himself, there are also no signs of giant activity in Blackreach. You know the classic giant camps, the tribal patterns on things, mammoth cheese, a big fire. As far as I can tell, he doesn't seem to have a home or base down here. He just walks around aimlessly back and forth, lost and lonely. And moving on down the road, approaching the darker corners of Blackreach, we'll be met by the lovely glowing grove. It's not anything mysterious, at least not in a narrative sense. It's quite simply a lovely little spot to take in a breath of dank cavern air and save a moment for reflection. And while mushrooms are not in short supply in Blackreach, this cluster of midlife spore sprouts just has an extra sense of wonder and comfort about it. So now that we've had a chance to collect ourselves, let us continue on down the road to possibly my favourite curiosity in Blackreach. Nestled in a seemingly bare and boring corner of Falzar Dum Din, we'll spy with our little eyes something beginning with F. That's right, fun. No, just joking, it's a farm, and a pretty cool one. Not that you'd believe it, but this farm is growing mushrooms. Of all plants, well, mushrooms aren't plants, they are a fungi, which is a different kingdom. But of all the growable, on a farm edible, growy things, mushrooms are the least surprising. It had to be mushrooms, really, there is no surprise there. We can find all varieties here, in this damp field, except the glowing mushroom, but they grow on cavern walls and such, and would have no place sprouting from the soil like these other varieties we see before us. To be specific, there are four white cap growing here, two fly amanita, two blisterwort, three bleeding crown, three impstools, and one namira's rot. The only mushroom missing is the scaly foliota, and while there are some lichen and again the glowing mushroom they're missing, but they're not really expected to be growing in a field of dirt. Whereas the scaly foliota matches the classic stem mushroom top kind of mushroom, and it's not here. Now this is a good place to grow them, as there sure is a lot of water dripping down onto the soil from above. Maybe the roof is extra leaky or something, but if we look up, we'll have probably my favourite thing in all of Blackreach. A Dwemer rain machine. 
they built a huge piece of piping and valves and grates to drain water from the cavern and gently drip it down onto the soil below, acting as a watering system to grow the mushrooms in the field. I love that someone at Bethesda Game Studios went to the effort of making this for something that almost no one would ever think about. It's one of those classic touches that makes these games what they are. We'll also see that there are three Dwemer dwellings here, two of which have collapsed and caved in, but one we can enter. This is the second of the two Dwarven houses we can actually enter, the other being Sindorian's Field Laboratory, which we explored at the start of the video. So heading on inside, this is the Farm Overseer's house. We'll be met by an overwhelming array of wonderful things to inspect. There are plenty of random objects like bones, potions, weapons, clutter items like Dwarven plates and cups, cupboards littered with miscellaneous items, hunks of Dwarven metal laying around, but out of all of these things, what's really interesting. I'd say what we can find on the table here, as I think it highlights that a Falmer has been living here much more recently than any Dwemer would have been. As we can find a Falmer bow, a skeever tail, which we all know the Falmer love to eat, and there is also a plate with a glowing mushroom on it, suggesting that whoever was here has been eating the mushroom. And we know the Thalma love mushrooms. If you follow me on Instagram, you may remember the Thalma mushroom barbecue I found in a dungeon. Anyway, point being, I'm certain these have been placed here to tell us that a Thalma now lives here and likely now controls the mushroom farm out the front. And while the Dwemer definitely set this area up as a farm to grow plants and possibly fungi, it makes me wonder whether or not these mushrooms were being grown by the Dwemer, or if this new Falmer farm has taken over, pulled up whatever plants were left by the Dwemer, if any, and now has planted his own mushroom farm. Another very curious find in here is the classic blue glowing splatters that we always see in caves that have been populated by Thalma, and these can be found on the ceiling of the house. Now I always thought that this was like the roots of the fungi spreading through the cracks in the stone ceilings of caves, and it has little tendrils that have grown down, you know, like the roots of a plant growing through soil, through rocks, things like that. But given that this is now growing on dwarven metal, makes me believe that this is simply a moss or sheep fungi that grows on the surface of things, rather than growing through it, as there is no way a fungi could penetrate through a metal roof, especially not a dwarven metal roof which has different properties to normal metal thanks to tonal architecture. There are also two chests in here which of course will contain random level loot. So all in all, I have to say this is by far one of my favourite curiosities down here in Blackreach. I love the mushroom farm, I love the uniqueness of the farm overseas house interior, and I absolutely adore the rain machine. I looked at it for so long before I was like, oh damn man, it's a watering device. And even though the Dwemer have been gone for thousands of years, I guess you could say that they still reign in Blackreach. Next up, as we head south a bit further, we'll be met by the colossal column that is the Tower of Bazaar. An imposing structure to behold, with a bridge crossing the gap between the pathway and the entrance to the tower. Once crossing the bridge, a firelit doorway will greet us, inside which is an elevator to the Tower of Mazark. Once at the top and exiting the antechamber, we'll enter what looks to have once been a library. This room also has a very strange colour grading and everything almost looks oversaturated and ever so slightly out of focus. I don't know why this is and it is unique to this room. There are also a number of objects like a fire, a sleeping roll and a satchel suggesting that someone has been living down here long after the Dwemer were gone. Taking a look at the corners, we'll get a better idea of what this room once was used for. We'll find bookcases lined with now ruined books, various items of interest, pieces of armor, dwemer metal, potions, scrolls and the like. There are a number of chairs, benches and what seem to be desks, again making us believe that this was once a library or place or study of research. But what kind of research? We'll soon find out as we exit this room through the opposite hallway and out into a stunning chamber. Straight away we'll be met by this brass orb that almost looks alien, huge and hard to comprehend what on earth this could be for. An esoteric sphere reminding us of the unmatched technological advancement of the Dwemer culture. If we follow this around soon 
enough, we'll be walking up a ramp, which will lead us to a greater wonder and awe. A huge observatory looking room, which is curious, as we are underground, so we won't be looking up at the stars. Well, if you have seen my lore video on the actual Elder Scrolls, you'll know what this is. And if you haven't seen that, be sure to check that out. It's a very interesting video and gets pretty metaphysical. So what we have here is a Dwemer Ocularie. Up on the ceiling here, we have the Ocularie's lenses. And on this platform, we have the control panel, which is used to move the lenses and reflectors around. Now, this machine was used to read the Elder Scrolls, the knowledge from which would then be copied onto a Dwemer lexicon, which could then be read by the Dwemer. So what they did was they invented a way to transcribe the knowledge of an Elder Scroll onto something else, completely bypassing the severe and sometimes lethal side effects of reading an Elder Scroll with one's mortal eyes. Normally in all other cultures in the Elder Scrolls, when someone reads an Elder Scroll, there are great sacrifices to be made. They'll be sent blind, they'll be sent insane. The knowledge that they read is influenced by their mind and is never a true reflection of what's on the Elder Scroll. But again, the Dwemer have completely bypassed this and can just basically copy and paste what's on the Elder Scroll onto a lexicon, then read the lexicon. Now this could explain how the Dwemer became so unfathomably technologically advanced and could harness metaphysical engineering techniques such as tonal architecture. Which will be a lore video for another day, but basically the theory is that the Dwemer could get all of the knowledge from all of the Elder Scrolls with zero of the sacrifice or side effects. Kind of having their cake and eating it too. Now back to the room, there are a number of chairs and tables scattered around the room, likely where scholars and researchers sat and scribed. There is also a skeleton in the middle of the room and while you might be thinking it's the skeleton of a Dwemer, it's not. This is Drocht and next to him is his journal. The contents of which just tell the story of how he was sold a cube by a Khajiit which then led him down into Blackreach and he then got trapped here due to a pack of wolves at the top of the elevator preventing him from escaping. Now Drocht's presence in this place likely explains the kind of makeshift campsite we see set up down in the library downstairs. And speaking of, moving back down to this very room, we can discuss just how absolutely sad it is that all of these ancient Dwemer books have been destroyed. Not only would any knowledge from the Dwemer be amazing, but just think, these books likely contained the transcribings of the Elder Scrolls, as this is the very place where they were transcribed onto lexicons. We stand before the ruined and unreadable remains of once readable transcriptions of the actual Elder Scrolls. The unbound knowledge these books once held. It makes your blood run cold to think that it was all here. It's all still here just at the wrong time. An amazing place, but honestly, the dissonance of depression and lost knowledge truly is the primary emotion here at the Tower of Mazark. But there is still some life to be had here. If we make our way down the stairs that wind around the Tower of Mazark, about halfway down, we'll find the forgotten loot, where we'll find some scrap Dwemer metal, which can be smelted down into Dwarven metal ingots and used in smithing or sold on to a blacksmith or a merchant. And there is also a chest here, which, oh man, you knew it. It will contain random leveled loot. Now making our way down the stairs even further, we have something that truly isn't that curious, but I love the detail nonetheless. From this steaming vent pipe, there is a small and slow drip of water falling down to the soil and stone below. But right where the drip is landing, a crimson known root is sprouting from the ground. A super menial and plotless detail, but these are the kinds of things I love about the Elder Scrolls games. Super detailed environmental storytelling, something that almost no one would notice. But a level designer or developer decided to put a plant growing right under the water drip because, hey, it makes sense. I adore this kind of stuff. Although to some, this kind of stuff is an absolute drip. But I mean, heh, what are you expecting from this video? So moving on all the way down the stairs and across the body of water that awaits us at the final level, we have the Shoreside Village. Much like the small Falma fishing village we saw earlier, these guys have set up camp and are gathering fish for food, which they have cooked over a fire. 
There is a Thalma in each of the two little huts here. There is also a chest over on a rock surrounded by mushrooms. And as far as I can tell, this is the only Thalma styled chest in all of Blackreach. I could be wrong, but after exploring this place for over two weeks, I can not recall seeing another. Now up in the darkness, there is actually a third Thalma hut tucked away in the Shroud of Shadow. There is also a third Thalma up here to go along with the third hut. Weirdly, there are two mining picks on the ground outside this third hut. Maybe the Thalma were mining here, or maybe they just got their slaves to mine? I'm not too sure what story this is meant to tell, so I guess you could just take your pick. Moving down the river, Tad will run across the Riverside Cove, a small cutout in the stone wall in which there is almost a shrine-like setup. There are two Dwemer unit deployment valves on the walls from one a Dwarven Sphere will pop out if we get too close. Now at the back there is a large golden pot containing the infamous Crimson Known Roots. There is a stone table holding potions, a dwarven metal ingot, random pieces of dwarven metal and scrap, and a dagger. It's a strange spot in the sense that it does look like a shrine, where the Dwemer have placed their offerings. But, as far as we know, the Dwemer were non-theistic. They didn't worship any gods. They praised and strived for logic and reasoning, but they didn't have a pantheon or bow down to any entities. They knew the Daedra and the Aedra existed, but they did not see them as superior beings. So what this shrine-like site with offerings laid out could be for, that is a curiosity that someone else will have to shrine some light on. Now even further downstream from here, as the mouth of the river widens, a great waterfall waits at the edge. But in the middle, we have the Crimson Sentinel, a stone bluff jutting out and above the water adorned with red mushrooms and a crimson nern root. A perilous location to be perched and an even more perilous location for the player to get to. As of course, there is a quest to collect the Crimson Known Root, so to get this one, one would have to whirlwind sprint off this high location, then fall with great accuracy and land on this small stone target. Now let's say you do fall off here, then you'll be face to face with our next curiosity. What I have called the Titan's Fingers. These colossal mushroom feelers, tentacles, tendrils, hentai actors, whatever these things are, they are massive. We see similar ones hanging from the roof. This combined with the colour does lead me to believe that they are related to all of the mushrooms and various fungi in Blackreach. But this is the only place where these fingers are going up instead of hanging down. Not only that, but they are numerous times bigger than the other ones we see hanging from the ceiling. Maybe there's something in the water making these things sprout and grow much larger than any other around. They almost come together to make a waving forest of blue, making the player feel like a small fish under the ocean amidst the arms of an anemone. And amidst the sea of Titan's fingers, we'll see a staircase leading to a door attached to a Dwemer Tower. This is the derelict pump house. Inside, it appears to be living up to its name, as there is an overwhelming amount of pipes, vents, valves, ancient Dwemer machines pumping and whirring away. There is a stone bridge through the middle, and hot, glowing, steaming water on either side. If we dive down into the water on the southern side, we'll see there is a valve that we can turn. Upon activating it, the bars will lower, giving us access to the chamber under the bridge. In here there is a chest and a crimson known root. There is also another valve that we can turn. This will lower the bars on the other side so now we can swim out into the northern water and exit up via the stairs, where we'll be met by a little dwarven spider still working away after all these years. His overtime's gonna be massive. At the top of the stairs, next to the elevator exit, there is another wall-mounted chest, and just like all the others, it will contain random level loot. Now we can exit into the lift and take that up to the higher levels. This will exit us at the top of the tower amidst the floating tips of the Titan's fingers, and at the place where we would have needed to whirlwind sprinted off of to get our hands on the Crimson Sentinel we saw a minute ago. So now we'll be up on an area of spanning, intertwines, connecting stone bridges high above the water below. 
Following them south will be at the entrance of the Raldbathar Market, a rather interesting location. On the left side of the door, we have a small fenced off segment, inside of which is a chest mounted on the wall, which will of course contain random leveled loot. And on the other side, we have another fenced off area, except this one is barred off with a locked gate that will have to be lockpicked if you wish to enter. Once through the gate, we'll find a small shelf at the back with a wall mounted chest which houses random level loot of course and a soul gem sitting next to it. Now across from this, there is what I can only imagine to be a shop front, the kind we see in banks and such with a small window for the shopkeeper or teller or whoever is on the inside to deal and trade with customers on the outside. To back this theory up, there are a number of raw ore pieces sitting on the countertop as if they were being sold or purchased. After all, this is the entrance to the Raldbathar Deep Market, so the likelihood of this being a market stall, yeah, it's pretty much concrete. Now just down the road from this market is the High Patrol Hut, tucked away and hidden in the dark corner of this cliff shelf. A small waterfall cascades down, producing a small creek that then flows off the edge and down towards the derelict pump station. Across the creek there is a Falmer hut that contains one Falmer, and outside there is a second Falmer who constantly patrols back and forth from the hut to cross the creek and back. What exactly are these guys are doing up here, I'm not too sure. Maybe it's their holiday retreat, a place to get away, up in the hills for the weekend. Sadly, there isn't anything else of interest here, no chests, no weird skeletons or anything of the sort. Just a relatively hidden Falmer hut, high up in the cliffs. I guess we'll just have to leave this place on anything but a cliffhanger. If we follow the water back down to the basin in which the titan's fingers sprout from, and then go over to the easternmost side of the water, marked by the huge Dwemer lanterns glowing through the haze and mist of the gushing waterfalls above, we can find a staircase that leads back up to the higher levels. If we turn to the left halfway up, this will lead us back to the arena that we saw earlier on in the video. However, for this curiosity, we'll need to take the stairs up to the right. This will lead us to the trolls of Falzar Dum Din. As we've made our way through Blackreach and run across unexpected creatures, these trolls just add to the list. Firstly, let's inspect their humble abode. They have chosen a small area underneath some steam pipes. Maybe this helps them stay warm down here. Taking up residence next to a heat source, it makes sense. There are a number of mushrooms and roots, glowing rocks, the whole nine yards when it comes to Blackreach assets. There are also a number of glowing mushrooms down here, likely the perfect place with all the moisture and the heat from the pipes. These mushrooms also generate a lovely natural lighting for the trolls that'll come in handy when they resell. Now we can also find random humanoid bones scattered across the floor like throwing die in a back alley gamble. Occasionally as the trolls patrol around they will kick the bones. So how did two frost trolls end up living in Blackreach? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Maybe they've been down here forever. Maybe there is another entrance into Blackreach we just don't see in the game. And yes, while there are lifts and the like to the surface of Skyrim, I do not think the trolls have been using machinery. More likely there's some hidden cave or passageway the troll made their way down. Although why they are here and not in the YouTube comment section where trolls belong, it's a real mystery. Ah, now to polish off Blackreach, the forgotten kingdom of Falzar Dum Din, we will fully explore and inspect the Silent City, the massive towering township that takes up the center of this cavern, an area ripe with intrigue and mystery, with a number of interior locations to explore and get lost in if one is not too careful. But before we get into the interiors, let's explore most of the exterior and what remains we'll come back to. So we'll see plenty of Falmer here and plenty of Falmer slaves. Humans, Mur and beast folk have been taken by the Falmer and turned into thralls. I personally feel like they could rebel and fight back, just speak to each other, hatch a plan and destroy their Falmer overlords in a minute or two. Anyway, let's talk about some of the things around here. Firstly, the mushrooms. The little ones, that is. The ones that are only found in Blackreach and are also unharvestable. They're just a nice decoration. Anyway, all throughout this cavern of Blackreach, they can be found, and they are blue, just like most things in here. 
As we can see on screen right now, a blue mushroom, just like all the other ones we've seen throughout the video. But for some reason, all of these little mushrooms within the Silent City boast a much more green hue than a blue hue. There does not seem to be any obvious answer to why this is. I was thinking that it might be the yellow light coming off of the orb in the center of the Silent City courtyard, but even then, mushrooms well out of sight and reach of the orb's light were still green within the Silent City. Maybe they're just envious. Maybe they're just from Mario and found their way into the wrong game. Although they would go nicely with a dish of green eggs and ham. Now, if you are convinced that these mushrooms look green because they are blue, then got hit by the yellow light mixing together to make green, then explain this. These scraggly bushes in Blackreach are white or a light gray. As we'll see here, this is a normal white slash light gray bush as we see all throughout Blackreach. But then in the Silent City, these same bushes are clearly blue. Now I am no, well I am a physics expert, but I can tell you white plus yellow does not equal blue. So back to the other point, this is why I don't think the yellow light is the cause of the green mushrooms. And back to the new point, why the hell are these bushes blue? They aren't like slightly, ooh, this is a bit light blue, kind of blue. These are legit dictionary definition blue. Maybe leading a little to the turquoise side, but still, this isn't a normal bush or shrub or whatever this is. It looks like every plant I've ever tried to grow, buy it with leaves, one day later, I've got a skeleton. Although, mine never turned blue. So, I think that these blue brush shrubs might have something to do with all of these glowing blue rocks, which I have theorized is Ethereum. We touched on this earlier on in the video, and it's not confirmed, but a logical conclusion would be that yes, these blue rocks are in fact Ethereum. After all, it looks exactly the same as Ethereum, and Ethereum is the reason the Dwemer came down to Blackreach in the first place. So these blue bushes may actually be Ethereum bushes. Not bad. But that doesn't explain why the rest of the bushes throughout Blackreach are white and not blue like the ones found within the Silent City. Something weird is going on here, between the green mushrooms and the blue bushes. It's interesting nonetheless that a developer chose to create a reskin just for the Silent City mushrooms and bushes. Very strange indeed, and for Bethesda, very off color. And before we make our way inside the Silent City, there is one more thing out here that I want to grab a hold of and swing back and forth. This lever. On the wall, atop the main entrance into the Silent City courtyard. For the life of me, I cannot figure out what it activates, if anything that is. I have flicked this thing back and forth for hours and had no response. <laughs> We've all been there, right guys? All true stories aside, this thing has got me stumped and I genuinely have not a clue as to why it's here or what its purpose is or was meant to be. So, switching over to the interiors of the Silent City, let us begin in the Silent City Catacombs. Down by the water's edge on the eastern side of the Silent City, there is a tunnel entrance in to the Silent City Catacombs. Be warned though, this place is strange. As soon as we enter, our eyes will have a hard time adjusting to the very obscure and unique color grading and lighting in here. Going from the neon blue light show that is Blackreach into this void of almost any chromatic character is quite alarming and something I've not seen anywhere else in Skyrim. So basically, it just looks like they turned down the colors and saturation by 80% to give us this old place an almost black and white color. You know, things that are normally blue like these glowing mushrooms in this geo deposit almost look just black and white because all the color's been sucked out of them. The color scheme aside, the first room has numerous amounts of vents, valves, hatches and the like. Also, half submerged is the pump intake. The very same one we saw earlier on in the video, underneath the tonal vent station. This is how I confirmed that it was in fact a water intake, as this one is half in the water and half out of the water, therefore has a splashing effect, letting us know that the water is either going in or out. Now up on the wall, there are several vent covers, but weirdly, there is one we've never seen before in Blackreach or, to my knowledge, in any of the Dwemer ruins in Skyrim. I've never seen this asset used before. Now it may seem menial and not interesting at all, but given so many unique weapons didn't get unique skins, yet this valve hatch in the Silent City Catacombs gets its very own skin, 
That is strange to me. Now just down the hallway at the corner there is a chest sitting next to a pipe and a light. This will of course contain random leveled loot. Continuing on this path we'll see our first Falmer and at a room at the end there is a switch which when flicked will activate the Dwemer trap in the hallway around the corner killing any Falma who was standing there. Moving through, this would appear to be some kind of emergency water overflow release channel. Again, I've not seen a setup like this ever before in Skyrim, with this smoothed and rounded wall, with a slight water flow coming off of it, suggesting that this is some huge canal or draining chute. There are also some pipes and a curved bed-like shape to the layer above, once more suggesting it has been designed to hold and direct large amounts of water. The connecting hallway is also circular, making me wonder what kind of huge amounts of water the Dwemer were having to deal with in here. Maybe it's more of a mechanical Ethereum refining dump chute rather than say a stormwater drain, as I wouldn't imagine much unexpected water rushing through the Silent City, you know. With that said, after going through a little further, there is a room that has a fair bit of underwater exploration to do. While there is a metal grate which provides a fairly dry platform above the drowned rooms below, the water is still higher than it should be. Now if you dunk your head under the water to see what's down there, in total we'll find three chests, which of course will contain random wet leveled loot. Now this either means that the Dwemers stored things underwater in chests on purpose, or something went terribly wrong and this room was flooded. So pressing on further, we'll come out into the top floor of the canal room we saw just a minute ago, where we can make our way past a number more Thalma and into the final room, which is larger and more open, at the end of which we can find a door that will take us into the next interior cell, the pumping station. Once inside the pumping station, we'll be back to the normal colour grading and lighting of Skyrim, which comes as a refreshing wave of revitalised life for our eyes. In here we'll find more Falma and more Falma slaves. This place appears to be exactly what it is described as, a pumping station, with various cogs spinning, gadgets whirring, valves releasing and closing. Once again, I'm not too sure where or why they are pumping water here but there do seem to be a number of broken pipes, yet everything seems to be intact and above water. Now if we head up the stairs in the main room and exit out the door in front of us, we'll come out onto a magnificent balcony overlooking Blackreach. This is also the only way to get onto this balcony. Now on the other side, there is a door which leads us back into the pumping station, but to the upper level we could not reach otherwise. Where at the end, tucked away, there is a chest amidst a big cluster of machinery. This chest will of course contain random leveled loot. Now if we jump back down, then go up the stairs, but this time turn around and head through the other door, we'll come out onto a walkway above the Silent City Courtyard. This walkway leads us directly to a door that takes us to an upper tower of the Debate Hall. We will enter an upper circular room with a high ceiling and there is a spiral staircase that twists down into the main Debate Hall room. And what a room this is. It's quite simple in concept, but really cool historically. It is now populated by the slimy Felmer and their slaves, and before we talk about why it's cool, let's have a look around. So firstly, any door you see in here, no, there's nothing cool behind it. There's like five different doors and all of them just lead back out to the Silent City. So it's definitely got a lot of access points for the Dwemer of old to come and go, making attending the debate hall easy and accessible for the Dwemer population. There are also a number of levels and walkways, all of which however draws to the center, which is the podium type platform, with a series of pews and benches lined up in front of it so the masses could sit and witness a speaker. On the top level at the back there is this strange room which appears to be a cell of some kind with a small table like object in the middle and now there's a skeleton with a speech skill book a dance in fire book six next to it. Now again the whole modern day book in Dwemer Ruin makes me think that this book was brought here by someone in recent years or at least more recent years than the Dwemer which probably means that this skeleton is the result of a 
Thalma locking a misbehaving prisoner in here or something of the sort, as I doubt the Dwemer would lock someone in a holding cell to die inside of their debate hall, especially with a book from the future. That's very, very unlikely. And as to be expected, there are a number of mechanical assets in here doing things that no one can figure out. Maybe it's the air conditioning, I don't know. Okay, so that's pretty much all there is to be seen in here, so why is the debate hall cool? Well, it's the debate hall within the Silent City, within Blackreach, which was colonized by the Dwemer to research Ethereum. So just think of all of the debates, discussions, and ultimate decisions that were made by the ancient Dwemer civilizations in this very room. Alliances were forged and broken in this very room. Reality bending decisions were made in this debate hall. It's a really cool place to just stand for a moment and reflect upon the Dwemer and their society. And if you disagree with that, well, this is the place for it. After all, it is the debate hall. So now we'll make our way back out into the Silent City Courtyard and across it to the west, where we will enter the final interior location, the Hall of Rumination. A structure that towers high above the Silent City, with a treat awaiting us at the top. So in we go. Straight away, there's a lot going on here. Numerous doors, staircases, Thalma slaves, and Thalma. So firstly, in the center of the room, in Nation, there is a table with some chairs. Occasionally, the Thalma slaves will sit here and reflect upon their decisions that led them here. Now, down the stairs at the back of the room, there is this weird sub-partial basement type room, which has a very low ceiling and something of the like that I have not seen before in a Dwemer ruin. There is also a Thalma down here just trudging around, and apart from some stone slabs and some gears, nothing else down here. So back up to the central room, there is a staircase that leads up to two short hallways, both of which lead to other rooms. One has a very strange sight indeed. Three stone chairs pulled up close and facing an altar that holds nothing, with two Thalma slaves sitting and just staring at the nothing. Apart from a wall-mounted chest at the back, which will contain random leveled loot, there's nothing else in this room, and it's giving me some creepy paranormal horror movie vibes. These Thalma slaves just seem to be hypnotized, again, by nothing, just a blank slate. Uh, maybe the Thalma only capture slaves with the same IQ as them. Anyway, to the other room, which seems much more practical, serving as a dining hall and a sleeping quarters for the slaves, with a series of beds lining the walls and a large stone table at the back. Now back out to the second level of the main room behind a small dwemer lattice wall, there is a lever. When activated, this will open up the sealed gate across the way, granting us access to the stairs which lead up to the higher levels of the Hall of Rumination. Now at the top of the stairs, there is a gate, but this one will have to be lockpicked open. Once through, we will be met by another Thalma patrolling the hallways. And right in front of this gate is a lift that will take us back to Blackridge, but we'll come back to this in a minute. So back near the gate that we just lockpicked, there slotted away in a dark corner there is a chest, and you know what kind of loot it will contain. Now around the corner is another chest with two rubies and a Dwemer cog in front of it, and you guessed what's inside the chest. All that is left is a staircase to our left, at the top of which is a door that leads out into Blackridge. After walking through that, we'll come out onto a very large balcony overlooking the Silent City Courtyard. There is one Falma slave out here, but apart from that, yeah, there's not really anything of interest out here apart from a nice view of the courtyard. So now, let's go back inside and we'll take the elevator all the way to the top. Ah, a door. Open it. And here we are, at the top of Blackreach. A balcony to trump all others. A view fit for a king. High above all the ribble-rabble and jibber-jabber of the society down below, the true king of Blackreach could sit here and observe his kingdom. His position has now been adopted by a Thalma and his two slaves who act as bodyguards. Whether or not this Thalma actually rules over all of the Thalma in Falzar Dum Din, 
Oh, he can't be said for sure, but he sure looks like he's running things, especially with his goons beside him. Of course, we could kill him and crown ourselves king or queen of Blackreach. Now, another cool little touch is behind the elevator, where there is a small path that wraps around the curvature of the tower, and right at the end, there is a large golden pot in which is a crimson nern root. As always, I love these tiny touches that reward the explorer. Now there is one last curiosity, one I'm sure a lot of us know, one that makes its way into just about any and all genres of Skyrim video. The Orb, or the Sun as it's officially labelled, this huge art decor, architecturally styled chandelier of Falzadam Din, generating both heat and light for the society of Dwemer that once filled this cavern. A beacon of the Dwarven culture's strength and advancement with technology and pushing beyond the physical boundaries, the Great Orb of Blackreach. It holds a secret though, watch this. Fus Roda! Using the unrelenting force shout at the orb will summon a unique dragon named Vulthoyol from the far off depths of Blackreach. Now before you ask, yes I checked where he actually spawns from and it's at the back at the Reeking Tower. So he's not actually in Blackreach until the orb is shouted at which spawns him in so sadly he doesn't have some awesome lair of his own that we can explore. Now before we get into the lore of the dragon, let's talk about his easter egg properties. Again, if you haven't already checked out my Skyrim easter egg video, definitely check it out, it's a lot of fun. So Vulthoyol is a dragon living in a dwarven city. Because of this, Vulthoyol is believed to be a reference to Smaug from the Tolkien's Book of the Hobbits published in 1937. Now in regards to his lore, well, not much is known. His name Vulthoyol means Dark Overlord Fire in Dovazu, the dragon tongue. Now how a dragon got down here, no one knows. I mean the trolls were a big enough mystery, let alone a dragon. And how long this dragon's been down here? Again, anyone's guess is as good as the next. Shame we didn't get to have a chat with him, as dragons can speak, so you'd think that having a visitor for the first time in a thousand years would warrant a chat before leading straight to slaughter. Nevertheless, it's a really cool easter egg and more aptly a really awesome curiosity. And quite fittingly, the final curiosity was a dragon, because this video really did do just that drag on. And with the ultimate winged menace Vulthoyol, we have now fully explored and curated the curious curiosities for Blackreach. I do hope you have enjoyed this utterly unique area with its forests and gardens of glowing mushrooms swaying through the thick haze, the intrigue, strange treasures, lost archaic echoes of the most mysterious race in Tamriel's history, the Dwemer. So whether they were new finds or old friends, I do hope that you have enjoyed the curious curiosities of Blackreach. Thank you very much for watching, I've been Camel, and I do hope that you have thoroughly enjoyed the Curating Curious Curiosities video for the ancient and magical underground Dwemer Kingdom, Blackreach, or in the Dwemeris tongue, Thal Zadam Din. If you did enjoy this video and you would like to see more of these type of videos, please consider subscribing. It helps me know that people are interested in these kind of videos and in the long run will result in more of them. And if you do enjoy these CCC videos, please feel free to check out the links in the description. These of course will lead you directly to the Curating Curious Curiosities video playlist or the specific video of your choice. If you did learn something new in this video, please leave a like, I'd appreciate it greatly. 
And if you do have any theories, backstories, imaginings, or explanations for any of these curious curiosities, please leave a detailed explanation of what your thoughts are in the form of a comment down below. I'm very interested in hearing some of your explanations for some of these ever so strange and curious finds in Blackreach. The community's collective mind power will be much greater than mine, I hope. So hopefully together we can come up with all of the backstories and explanations for these curious curiosities. Now down there in the description, you can find links to my social media. Be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter. And if you would like to support the channel in a more personal way, you can of course become a patron or sponsor right here on YouTube. As I'm sure you know, all of my time and energy goes into making these videos that I create for you to enjoy. So your support is most appreciated and welcomed in any and all forms. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you for supporting the channel. And I will see you very shortly in the next video. I'll see you there soon.